Congratulations on completing the last task. The set of grid points that you've now drawn should look something like a circle. Furthermore, if you count the number of grid points that are shown in your diagram, and you divide by the total number of grid points that you generated, you should get a number that is close to pi divided by 4. In this video, we're going to think a little bit more about what you just did, and, about this pro and through this process of thinking, we're going to work out how a simple algorithm for doing Monte Carlo sampling operates. Before we get onto that, however, let's review how the numerical algorithm we have just introduced for solving the integral operates. As discussed in the previous two videos, we can numerically integrate the curve shown here and thus find the area under the curve by firstly drawing a regular grid of, of squares underneath our graph as shown here. We then determine whether the midpoint of each of our grid po points are under the curve or not. We then finish by counting the number of squares whose midpoints are under the curve and by multiplying this count, n in, by the area of each of the individual squares. As is clear from the diagram shown here, this will give us an approximate value for the integral. Let's now suppose that the area of each of the grid, grid squares shown here is equal to 1. We can thus ascribe a value to each square that tells us what contribution it makes to our final estimate of the integral. Obviously, the points under the green line will all contribute a value of 1, while the points that are above the green line will contribute a value of 0. Calculating the integral is thus a matter of adding together all these numbers. Furthermore, we can express this process of adding together all these numbers mathematically using summation notation. In the expression shown at the top right of this slide, the sum runs over all the grid points, and the SI values are the ones and zeros that tell us whether or not these points are under the green line or not. We now arrive at an important realisation in terms of Monte Carlo sampling, namely that because the series is finite, the order in which we add together the terms is not important. Consequently, even if we add all the terms together in the random order that is shown on this next slide, the final value that we get for the integral will be the same. Now suppose that the height of the grid was h, and the width of the grid was b, and that we don't want to calculate the integral, but that instead we want to calculate the quantity shown in the top right slide of the slide, i.e. the area of the green the area under the green line divided by the total area of the grid h times b. This is obviously equal to the sum of all the SI values divided by the total number of SI values. Furthermore, if we calculate this quantity by summing over all the SI values once, twice, or any integer number of times, this quantity will always take the same value. I have further investigated this process of calculating the ratio at the top left of this slide by running over the summation of SI values multiple times in the graph shown here. Here, though, I have also calculated the sum for non-integral values at k. Let me make the meaning of this graph more clear by explaining what is shown in more detail. To generate the graph, I essentially generated the following series of 10, 1 and 0 values. I then summed over all the terms in this vector multiple times. The points shown in black dots are the values obtained when k was an integer. And as you can see, because there are five ones and five zeros in my series, all these values are exactly 0.5. To get the values when k is not an integer, I computed the sum using the expression shown in the label for the y-axis. There are 10 terms in my vector here, so n equals 10. The mod operation is then a way of getting the remainder when you divide i by n. Hence, 15 mod 10 is 5. To calculate the value of the sum with 55 terms, shown here, I thus summed the list five times and added on the first five terms in the list once more. What I hope you can appreciate from this graph is that there are deviations from the true value of the ratio when the sum contains a number of terms that is not a multiple of the number of elements in the list. However, 
As the number of terms that we add together to get the final value of the numerator increases, these deviations from the true value get smaller. To be clear, the point that I'm trying to make is that what we are calculating when we compute the sum shown on the right hand side of the equation at the top of the slide is the quantity a divided by h times b, which is the ratio of the area under the green line to the total area of the grid. The point that I was trying to make in the previous slide by doing the sum multiple times is that the ratio of the number of grid points that contribute to the integral to the ratio of the total number of grid points is a fixed quantity. This is why we get the same value for this ratio if we run over the sum multiple times. Furthermore, if we run over this the, uh, sum a non-integral number of times, we, there are deviations from the true value. But as long as we take a large number of sums in the deviate, large number of terms in these sums, these deviations are small. Now, suppose that instead of running through all the grid points in a fixed order, we just generated n grid points at random with replacement. The random variable would take a value of 1 if the sample grid point was underneath the grid, and a value of 0 otherwise. Furthermore, the probability of sampling a grid point that is underneath the green line would be fixed because the ratio of the number of points that are underneath the green line to the total number of points is fixed. The consequence of all this is that if we take a sufficiently large enough sample of randomly chosen grid points, we get a value for the ratio that is similar to the true value for the ratio that we would get by method method methodically running through each term in the sum. Furthermore, for the reasons alluded to in the previous slide, if we do this for a large enough sample of randomly chosen points, the difference between our estimated value for the ratio and the true value will be small. What we have arrived at is the most basic form of Monte Carlo sampling. You can think of this method as working by selecting grid points at random instead of systematically going through each of the grid points in turn as we did in the previous numerical algorithm. As discussed in the previous slide, this procedure works because the value that we get when we compute the finite series is independent of the order in which we add up the terms in that series. Furthermore, in some cases, this approach will even work when our series has an infinite number of terms. For example, for many cases, like the one shown here, we can replace the finite grid shown here with an infinite grid, which has coordinates at every real value for x and y in this two-dimensional grid. If we take a random list of points on this grid and compute the ratio using the method described on the previous slide, our estimate for this ratio will still converge to a fixed value because the ratio of the area under the curve to the total area is a fixed quantity. With all that theoretical background in place, let's now summarize by explaining the Monte Carlo algorithm that you're going to implement in order to estimate the area of your quarter circle. What you will do is as follows. You'll first find a rectangle that encompasses the whole integral. The base of this rectangle will have a length b, and the height of the rectangle will have a length a. In your case, this rectangle will be a square with a side of length 1. The first thing that you will need to write in your Python code or Blockly code will be some code to set two variables equal to zero as shown here. You then select one point at random that is inside the variable, the rectangle. You should now realize that the Python code to do this involves generating two uniform random variables using numpy random uniform. Once you have generated your random point, you then check whether or not the point that you have generated is underneath the curve that you would like to integrate. The particular point we have chosen here is not underneath the curve, and thus the variable z is set equal to zero when the inshake function is called in this case. If the point is under the curve, then z is set equal to one. For the case of the circle that you're about to do, you learned how to work out whether or not points are within the circle when you performed the task that you've just finished. The next thing that you do is you increment the two variables that you set equal to zero at the start of the code. 
The variable n here counts the number of random variables that you've generated, so it is increased by 1. The variable f sum, by contrast, counts the number of times that the points generated were underneath the curve. You thus add z to this quantity. Your code will then need to repeat this procedure of selecting random points and accumulating these quantities many times. So all of the code in the yellow box here will need to be inside a for loop. Once this for loop is completed, you can then compute the final interval using the expression shown at the bottom of the slide. In the end, the algorithm that I've introduced is rather simple. What we are essentially doing is calculating the sample mean for a random variable. To reflect this simplicity, the task that follows this video asks you to show how the estimate of the area depends on the number of samples that you generate this estimate from using code that should be familiar after the exercises that you did during the first three weeks of the semester. This task and the associated algorithm will hopefully prove easier than I have perhaps made it sound in this video. Good luck.